All right. Well, it's nice to see you, everybody. And uh, it has been a pretty awesome couple of months doing a series on what does the Bible say about blank. And thank you for leaning into it. Thank you for not judging us when we've taken on some controversial subjects. Thank you for uh, being part of this series. I'm kind of sad that today we're kind of bringing it to a a wrap-up. But uh, today we're going to spend time on what does the Bible say about itself. Uh, So I think we're going to have a blast. It's going to be great digging into this subject and, uh, but before I do that, I wanted to address something. How many of you have had a week, and I mean like capital W, capital E, capital E, capital K, like it's been like, wow. Would you raise your hand if you've had one of those weeks? Okay, I want to pray for you before we get started. Uh, Lord, a bunch of people in this room have had some ups and downs and just a, just a crazy last seven days, and Jesus, we give you that stuff. We give all that information, all that anxiety, uh, all the uh, maybe conflict, maybe confusion, maybe difficulty of this last week, and we offer that to you as an, as an offering. Uh, your word says, cast our cares on you, for you care for us. So we give you that, and, and Jesus, we ask that you would carry that because it's too heavy for us, and help us to focus on what you would have for us to hear today and not on this last week. Amen. So um, we talked about anxiety maybe, I don't know, three or four weeks ago, but something that was helpful to some of you that you fed back to me about was I've learned in my life that I don't just have to give the Lord something once. Sometimes I have to keep giving it to him. So something that's bugging me, something that keeps me up at night, something that is on my mind, sometimes I will have to give it to him like 16 times a day and just keep, it's a good discipline though, because maybe tomorrow it'll be 15 day, fifteen times, the next day it'll be 13. So, it, but just, just don't, I think sometimes we get messed up in our Christianity if we feel like, well, I already prayed about it. It's all done. We've got to remember there's the parable of the persistent widow, and there's all kinds of um, things in Scripture that say continue uh, to give the Lord things, continue to pray, continue to ask, right? Amen? Okay. Somebody needed to hear that. So today we're going to get into what does the Bible say about itself. And we've been through this series of what does the Bible say about this and this, and we talked about government and anxiety and money and gender and uh, cancel culture. We went through a lot of different things. What does the Bible say about all these things? And then we might say, well, who cares? You know, why do we care what the Bible says about X, Y, and Z? And I think there are two main reasons. The first one is because we're not smart enough to figure it out. Some of these things are complicated and we really need help. And I'm going to give you, let's have fun for a minute. I want to give you a little bit of proof of how not sharp we are. We all think we're smart until we try to turn on someone else's shower. Right? How many times, I mean, my kids, we're going to a hotel, we're going to someone's house, and there's always that, how do I get this thing to work? Right? Okay, check out this one. I love this one. If you think you're smarter than the previous generation, 50 years ago, the owner's manual of your car showed how to adjust the valves. Now it warns you not to drink the contents of the battery. <laughs> That's true. We are not as smart, not as sharp as we think we are. So, and, and it's, a, a, a wise man knows what he does not know. We got, we got to have a little bit of humility, right? So that brings me to the real reason why uh, we need to look to God's word for answers. If the Bible is what it claims to be, then it is God's very words for us today, not 2,000 years ago. This morning when you woke up, God had words for you whether you accessed them or not. He was waiting for you to lead you through the day through his word. It's his wisdom, his insight. It's instructions 
from the creator of all of life. How many of you have been to Ikea before? Okay. You need instructions. I think life is like Ikea. Like, I mean, I'm good at figuring stuff out, but I brought a few things home from Ikea and I'm like, I'm just going to set these instructions aside. Oh my gosh, did I mess it up. Is, am I the only one? Chris, am I, I'm not the only one, right? Some of that stuff is so complicated. Only Swedish people, is it Danish or Swedish? Only Swedish people could make it that complicated. I'm just saying. Life is complicated, and we need the Creator's instructions. And the Bible is the main way that God uh, reveals who He is to us. And His Word needs to be respected and loved and obeyed and memorized. And this is not me like waving a finger at you. Because we all get stuck in, oh, well, yeah, I have a Bible somewhere. Or, you know, I read it last year when I really needed it, and now I'm not so much. And We all fall into this trap of not accessing the owner's manual. And so today, I hope we can get back to, what's the owner's manual all about? Why is it important? What does it say about itself? And hopefully this can inspire all of us, myself included, to be in here more to allow this to read us, not just us reading it. So now if the, if the Bible is not what it says that it is, then we can treat it like any other book, like Homer's Iliad or Canterbury Tales or uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, some other important, you know, we could just say like, you know, hey, that's really fascinating reading. But it's not like that. I mean, even if you say it, in, you know, you say it in a link with a bunch of other pieces of literature, it's like, no, it doesn't really fit in with those because it really is different. So what are some of the claims that the Bible says about itself? Let's check them out. Um, I've got seven for you today. The first one is this. It's inspired. All Scripture, 2 Timothy says, is God-breathed. I love that phrase. And it's useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in what? Righteousness. That means being right with God. I think everyone on the planet, deep down, would want to be right, right? And then verse 17, so we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then look at 2 Peter 1. It says, above all, you must understand. So Peter's saying this is really important. No prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Prophecy never originated in human will, but those people, though they were human, they spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it's a partnership. People, God, writing something for us. And that's why we call it the Word of God, because we don't believe it was the Word of Isaiah, or the Word of David, or the Word of Matthew. We call it the Word of God on purpose because it says in itself that God spoke in these ways through people. They wrote it down for us to have. It's eternal. It's living. It's 66 66 books written by 40 different people over a period of 1,800 years with one message. I mean, that in itself is saying quite a bit, right? And all of it is a love letter to human beings. How many, of you, uh, how many of you in the room are human beings? How many of you online? Raise your hand if you're a human being. So this is for you. God doesn't waste time. He doesn't waste his breath. He doesn't just, you know, I'm going to write a thing. No, it's for us to be, uh, well, well, we'll talk about more of what it's for, but it's for us. So here's the second thing. It is true. Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect refreshing the soul. How many of you need your soul refreshed? Like, yes, please, right? The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. And look at Proverbs 30. It says, every word of God is flawless. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Don't add to his words. 
there's a little warning, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. We're not allowed to add stuff to his word. And it's true in faith and practice. When you need help, go here. If you want something reliable, uh, don't go on Facebook. Go here, right? It's also true in archaeology and history. It's interesting that if you read some, some writings from earlier last century, like the 30s, 40s, 50s, there were a lot of fairly liberal scholars that critiqued biblical archaeology. One example is, hey, there's no reference to King David anywhere in the ancient Near East, so that's obviously fake. And there are all these, you know, if you, if you pick up some of these um, things I actually studied in school, um, some of the, the books that were written earlier in the 1900s uh, were disproved by later archaeological finds. The Bible is one of the greatest resources for archaeologists in the Middle East because it's darn reliable. And, and so uh, I studied archaeology in school, and so if you would like to geek out on archaeology like, like I do, uh, my wife actually bought me an archaeology study Bible. So if you want to borrow this, I feel like somebody, I brought this on purpose, somebody needs this this week. You can borrow it for one week, not two. One week. It'll be right here. You can borrow it and check it out. But literally, in the pages, it'll show at the bottom where the site is that this passage is about. And, and it'll show like what's important about those, little, those sites and those cities, those tells, um, which is a pile of rubble um, in, in the Bible. It's remarkably reliable. Okay, uh, let's move on. If there are parts of the Bible where it seems to conflict, so you'll see in Judges it'll say something that in Chronicles looks like, wait a minute, who won the battle? How, how long did the guy actually live? Um, how many cattle were there? What, what's the deal? So there are some things in Scripture. Here's one example. Uh, in ancient Near East culture, it was normal to live to be 120 years old. A whole bunch of people miraculously lived to be 120 years old. 120 years old was an expression that meant a full life. Now, did someone actually live to be 120? I don't know. Does it matter? No, because the expression meant they lived to be old. Okay, that is one example of a whole bunch that you will find in one of these books that explains, hey, you know, here's the thing. Sometimes we think we're so smart. Remember we already went over that? And we think, oh, I caught God. He made a mistake on page 356. We're not that smart. We really aren't. And for 2,000 years, people have been saying, what does that thing on 356 mean? And so you can read smarter people than you and me in one of these books, and it's full of how, do, how does this fit in its uh, historical context? What was the context that the author was writing in? What was he trying to say, and why does that not translate into English very well? There you go. Okay, let's look at the next one. The third one is the Bible is authoritative, and it tells us that. So James 1.22 says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive or lie to yourself. So don't read it like it's a piece of literature that you don't have to act on. That is deceiving yourself. You're missing the point. The point is, do what it says. The Bible is an authority in our life, and it's something that we need to obey and do rather than just understand and read. I think one of the problems with Christianity in our day is so many people know it and don't do it. And then people look at churches and Christianity as a bunch of hypocrites. My daughter would call them hippos, right? And so the churches are full of hippos, and that's why people are saying, eh, let's do it. Let's learn it, live it, and, and then we can reach our culture more effectively. Amen? A couple of amens. Okay. Okay. Um, you guys online who are watching today, the people in the room are not amening that well, so I need you guys to amen. Okay. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 2 says, When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, look, look at this, you accepted it not as human word, but as it actually is. 
the word of God. So when Paul was preaching, when he was speaking, when he was giving people God's word, they understood what it really was. So a question for each of us today is, what is the authority in your life? Where do you look for authority? God's word, if it's understood correctly, will never lead you wrong. Now, sometimes you will misinterpret a thing, and then you will go act on it, and you will think you are hot stuff because you went and did this thing, and then you did it wrong, and then you realize, oh, I didn't understand his word very well. So one of the best ways we can understand his word is in community, where we talk about it, we discuss it in our community groups, in our rooted groups, in a family. You can just say, what do you think this means? And when you have a big decision to make, you can say, here's what I feel like I'm doing. Based on God's word, I'm going go to go do this thing. And in community, in his family, we can say, yeah, you're Donna, you got it right. Yes, I want to I pray for you and support you in doing that. Now, God's word will not lead you wrong. I can't think of anything or anyone else that I can make that claim of. Anything else I rely on as authoritative is going to screw up occasionally. Even my family, my education, my government, my right? God's word's reliable. Okay. Number four, it is powerful. I love these verses from Jeremiah. Is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks rocks in pieces. Boom, right? And so sometimes we just think it's a cute book on the shelf, and the Lord says, not so much. And then Hebrews 4, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So I like to see this verse as God's word is a sword. It's also a scalpel. So there are times when he is working in me for his purpose, and he can separate stuff that I can't see. I can't even see the stuff in my life, and he's dividing it and making it make sense. So number five is it's useful, which means it's practical. It's like it's, it's what I need in my real life. It's not 2,000 years ago Sunday school stories. I need his word right now in my life. So I want to tell you a couple things of what, God, what God's word means to me personally. So, and I think this is important not just about God's word, but about all, all of our lives and how we share our faith with others. I think that um, in the past, people wondered, is, it, is that thing true that you're talking about? And then I think culture moved a little bit more to, is that right? Is that best? I think now people are wondering, does it work? Is it pragmatic? Is it, how does it play out in your life? So, so I could just tell somebody about what God's word says about itself, and they might be bored or intrigued. But I think I could also say, here's what it means to me. So I want to tell you guys a couple ways that God's word is useful in my life. Like today, like right now, this is some of what uh, his word means to me. And so, so the first thing that, that God's word is to me is a mirror. This is not mine. This is my wife's. Dudes usually don't have something like this. But anyway, so God's word to me is like a mirror. It shows me what's going on where I may miss it. How many of you have ever gotten ready without a mirror? Like a few times in our lives, right? That's not normal for most of us. Do you know why? Because we don't want to go out the door with like the thing stuck in our teeth and our hair all crazy, right? Why would we go through life without God's word speaking into our lives and showing us what we actually look like? Let's not make assumptions that we have it all together, right? So I used to, in the old days... I used to see myself kind of like looking at God's word and going, well, I like this part, and I don't really like this part, and I think that that part doesn't fit right now. You know what I'm doing? I'm in judgment over God's word. That's not how it's supposed to work. 
God's word is in judgment over us, telling us about ourselves. Does that make sense? So if you feel like you're always looking down at God's word and telling it what to do, you got to flip that upside down. Okay. The next thing is God's word is a light. So I have found God's word to be amazing at helping me figure out my next steps in life. And many times people come to me and they say, Pastor, I'm not sure what to do. What do I do next? I don't know how to make this decision. And then I'll say, what's the Lord saying? And they'll say, I have no idea. And I'll say, are you spending some time with him? And they'll say, well, no, not for a while. And I'll say, there, there's a little problem. You don't know where to walk because you're not learning what he said about where to go in your life. So j I'm going to just blind you for a second. So this is just a reminder of his word is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. Right on? Okay. Should I turn it on or leave it in your eyes? Okay, I'll turn it off. And, and the last one is God's word is a weapon. Do you remember what Jesus did when he was tempted? So Satan said, hey, you should, you know, make these, these uh, stones into bread. Hey, you should do this. Hey, you Every time he used the word of God, Old Testament passages, to defend against the attack of the enemy so it wouldn't get in. And guys, we have a spiritual weapon that we don't use enough. And, and it's interesting, in, in the verse that says the sword uh, of the Spirit is the Word of God. Right before that, in the same passage, it says our fight is not against flesh and blood. We fight a spiritual war. Don't assume that physical weapons are going to work. And, I don't even, and some physical weapons that we have are like coping skills, time out, you know, I'm going to read a book, I'm going to listen to music. Those are great. But we have spiritual weapons, the word of God and prayer, that we need to fight the spiritual battle. So I have found over and over and over again, when I'm tempted, when I'm uh, stressed out, when I'm freaking out about something, I go back to God's word and I say, Lord, teach me. And, and I spend time reading. And sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes I'll have to keep reading for a half hour, 40 minutes, just kind of put on a little worship music and just spend some time with him. Sometimes I've got to pull out a chair and say, Lord, I need to be with you. Would, would you just be with me? Because I'm freaking out about this. And I really feel like the Lord meets me in those times. And he plants stuff in my heart and in my mind that when I'm tempted, when I'm facing this big decision, I'm able to pull it out. I'm ready to use it, and I'm ready to go. I'm coming for you. So, Jim, I think you should keep this for me for a little while, just as a, you know, okay. So, funny story, I, I put on Facebook probably about 10 years ago that I needed a sword. I was going to go speak at Hillcrest Chapel, and, and some guy who has a sword collection, of course, how many of you ladies have a sword collection? Anyway. So, so this guy reached out to me and he said, oh, I have a sword for you. Where should we meet? So we met at Starbucks in Calabasas. He literally brought a sword into Starbucks and set it on the table and everybody's looking at me like, you guys are nuts. Anyway, so he told me I could keep the sword. I didn't steal it. Anyway, so uh, let, let's get on to the next one. Uh, number six. God's word is centered on the person of Jesus. This has always just fascinated me. So the Bible is not just a collection of words of wisdom, and here's what you do and here's what you don't do. It also is a rescue and redemption story that points to the rescuer, the Messiah. So look at these words from Luke. Jesus is walking along. This is after his resurrection, People aren't, they don't know if he's raised or not. They've heard rumors. So he's walking next to a couple of his followers. And these aren't some of the 12. These are some other guys. And then Jesus said to them, how foolish you are. Because they're talking about, oh, this thing happened and we thought he was the guy, but maybe he's not. <laughs> so, so he's walking with them. And he says, how foolish you are. How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter glory? And then beginning with Moses, which is the Pentateuch, the first five books, and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. How cool to have a Bible lesson from Jesus himself, about himself. Like, I want to watch the YouTube of that. So, wow. Okay, and then a little bit later in the same chapter, he's with his disciples behind closed doors. He just appears and then, and then you know, says, peace to you, which I've always just thought is funny because they're like, oh my gosh, and he's like, peace to you. And then he says, this is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that's written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So he's saying, hey, the whole Old Testament is about me. You guys just haven't really been paying attention. And if you think that I'm coming to be this guy, you didn't read the whole thing because the Messiah is coming to suffer and to rule. So the written word points us to the living word. The living word is Jesus. So the book of John has a really interesting phrase in it, and it's all over the place, but John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. It's not talking about the Bible. It's the living word, and this word in Greek means the idea or the beginning, the, um, the big idea. And so it's saying that Jesus is the truth. Remember how he said, I'm the way, the truth? That, that's, that's what he's getting after here, that Jesus is the ultimate truth personified, and that the written word points to Jesus, the living word. And, and I, just, I just love how the things play off each other, that the whole written word points to the living word. Have you ever heard that song, Word of God Speak? So it's interesting, that is kind of about God's word and kind of about the living word and kind of how they point to each other. So check that out. So here's the last thing. God's word is precious. Now, we could have had 25 different things. I just chose seven. But the last one that I think is important, and this is where, where we want to land the plane for all of us today, is how precious God's word is and how precious it needs to be to us. Psalm 19 says, Decrees are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. How many of you like gold? Would you raise your hand? There's something about it, right? So God's word is more precious than this. And listen to this. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. So when this was written 3,000 years ago, they didn't have donuts. They didn't have candy. They didn't have, they had chocolate in a couple of cultures, but these guys would have never tasted it. So honey was the thing. So if you wanted sweet, that was it. So basically this is saying uh, it is sweeter than donuts and chocolate and candy and anything else you can think of that's great. God's word is that sweet. It is that beautiful in our lives. So here's a question for, for you right now. Is God's word precious to you right now? And And... Why is it or why is it not? Because maybe you used to read it more than you do now. You used to trust it more than you do now. What happened? And, and man, if it is all these things, wouldn't it make sense that our enemy would want us to neglect, not be in it? Because we lose our power. We lose our weapon. We lose our light. We lose our mirror. We lose our stuff if we're not in the book. But you might say, well, yeah, but, Pastor, I, I have this, I read this article about how many translations there are and about this ancient manuscript and about the Gospel of Thomas. And Okay, so let's, let's get into that for just a second. So remember how I said I studied archaeology? I love all that stuff. I love researching that stuff. I thought my life would be sitting in a pit, like digging stuff, taking pictures of it and drawing, because I was an archaeology dual major. I thought I'd be photographing pots 
and stila and translating it to prove that the Bible was true so that you guys sitting at Caneo Church would like have great stuff. God had other plans. So anyway, so if we look at the reliability of what we have, it's remarkably, amazingly good. I'll give you just a couple of specifics. So Old Testament canon, canon the word means rule. So the way that the Old Testament books were put together was decided between 200 and 300 BC. Now in uh, the late 1800s, and early 1900s, people said, oh, that was all decided later, and then they put in all these extra things that are prophecies about the Messiah, and it's all fake. The problem is the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered at Qumran, which showed that all of this stuff predated Jesus ever being on the planet. So we have all of these scrolls of most of the Old Testament books from 150 BC for sure. Like, so all of the guys who wrote those books just felt, you know, a little out of sorts because they staked their whole claim, their whole, you know, their, their uh, teaching credentials on that. So Old Testament, very reliable. In fact, 99.9% .9 reliable if we look at what I'm holding in my hand to what the Hebrew Old Testament looked like. It's just about perfect. Why isn't 100%, Pastor Kirk? Well, that's because some words don't translate well. And sometimes you're reading in Psalms and it says, we don't even know what this word means. Right? There are certain words that it says, like, this is our best guess of what this word means. Now, the great part is, it doesn't affect my faith if they don't know if this word meant the horns of the altar or the horns of uh, an animal. It doesn't matter. So what we have in our hands is really, really reliable. Testament canon uh, came into existence about 397 AD. The last New Testament writers were done in 120 AD. And so the New Testament canon was basically the guys decided because of all the heresies, what books are we willing to die for? These are the books we're willing to die for. Those, that's our New Testament. The extra books that are included in the Catholic Bible, Deuter Deuterocanical, Deutero, uh, what's the word? Deuterocanical, that's the word. So a second canon, uh, seven or eight books in some of the Catholic Bibles are the, the books they were not willing to die for, but they still liked. So the Catholic Bible, the Orthodox Bible, still continues some of those. Anyway, let's move forward. Why are there so many translations? Uh, because people have different tastes and because people have different priorities. Uh, and there are different types. Some are word-for-word -word translations. NASB, uh, ESV, good word-for-word -word translations. I like the NIV. It's a phrase-for-phrase -phrase translation because it reads a little easier, and I'm not that smart. So I like to have it make sense in modern English. And then you have paraphrases like the message uh, or the original Living Bible, which is, gives you the idea, but it gives you some more like cultural context in a way. So anyway, the, our English translations are remarkably accurate. They're based on 13,000 ancient manuscripts. Wow. And they all aim the same way and say the same stuff. And then we translate it into English. And, and if you read articles about how bad our translations are, those people are coming from, they're coming from a place, in my opinion, of trying to disprove the Bible, trying to have an excuse to not live up to this. They're not starting from the manuscripts and working forward. They're starting from their context now and working backwards and trying to find a problem. Because man, if you look at those 13,000, they are pretty darn good. So most people would say that our modern English New Testament is 99.5% accurate with the same issues of this word doesn't translate well. Not that we're missing anything, we have everything. Okay? Cool. So we come up with a lot of excuses, and I think the main reason is because we don't want to do it. We don't want to obey it. We don't want to put it into practice because it changes our lives. Right? How many of you growing up gave your mom bad excuses ever? Why do we do that with God? But I feel like we're like, well, I don't really understand what it means. And he's like, 
I made it plain as day. Love your neighbor. Like, is that a struggle for you? Like, just go do it. But we come up with lots of excuses, and sometimes our excuses are, well, the translation isn't that good. Well, I didn't really take Hebrew. Well, I didn't. We got some bad excuses, people. What we have in our hands is God's word for us today, remarkably accurate, proven over time, authoritative, true, and man, this is, cha- this is changing my life, and I hope that you will let it change yours. Okay, so here's the conclusion, and I want to ask the band to come on up for this. And, and let me say this, if you need help studying the Bible, and you're like, man, I'm just a rookie, I'm just getting started, you could look up online, I need some help studying the Bible, or you could reach out to me, Kirk at KaneoChurch.com, and I would love to give you a little workshop about how to get started and how to do this. Uh, my wife has taught a bunch of people how to study the Bible. Uh, Annie has taught a bunch of people how to study the Bible, and it's not hard, um, but we would love to get you started so you don't have any of those darn dumb excuses. So if you feel inspired to start, get started. How do you get started? Daily. And for me, I'm not a morning person. I read the Bible in the morning anyway because I feel like it sets me up for the day. And I have de- I've decided that if I feed the birds in my bird feeder and I get my cup of coffee and I start making my oatmeal, I like get my body moving, then I sit down in the backyard and I read God's word the birds are there, my coffee's there, I'm okay, okay? So it's not the first thing that I do, it's like the third thing that I do, but it's like 15 minutes after I'm up, I'm in God's word, it sets me up for the day. I don't know what your pattern is, but man, I need that. And I would encourage you to start with a little bit, start with a paragraph. Sometimes I tell people, read until you hit something, read until God shows you something, and then write that on a sticky note or put it on your phone and carry it with you all day. So don't try to read a whole book. Don't try to read a whole chapter often just to get through it. Uh, Read little sections. And the Bible app can be fantastic for you. So I just started uh, another Bible app, Devo, this morning. I invited some of you to start on Monday. And and it's all about, it's it's called The Bible Explained. It's from Life Church. And so um, if you're not part of it and you would like to join us, reach out to Kirk Stratton DeWitt on the Bible app. You can join our Bible app, Devo. And it's seven days. You'll get into God's word and we'll be able to share some thoughts back and forth. But I just want to encourage you to commit to make a change. If, If you just feel like, man, I've been out of this and I need to get back in this, step back into God's word and you will never regret it. But I'm telling you, man, someday you might regret not being in here because you're not ready for the stuff that you're going to face. Amen? So let's sing this song together, and then I'm going to share a couple of verses when we're done. I want to share two verses with you from Psalm 1, and I hope you'll carry these with you all week. And it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. And look at at the contrast. And I feel like that first verse, the first uh, part of that feels a lot like our culture. feels like normal. But whose delight, in contrast, is in the law of the Lord? Delight. What do you delight in? I mean, how cool to delight in God's word and be like, man, I'm excited about that. That's my hobby. That's my thing. And who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Why would we not want our lives to prosper? I mean, are we that nuts? I mean, here's the formula. Spend time with the Lord in his word, and the result is you're planted, and you're going to bear fruit. Beautiful. Man, that's what I want. So what has been your relationship with God's word this last year? And does that need to change? 
And if that needs to change, I want to pray for you right now that it would shift in your thinking and in your heart. And you would say, Lord, I want to be under your word, not over your word. I want to be living in and through your word, not leaving it on the shelf. So if that's you, just just pray along with me. Lord, I, I just admit that I have not put your word in its rightful place in my life, and I ask Jesus that you would change it, change my thinking, change my heart, change my patterns. And Holy Spirit, light up, illuminate your word in my life. God, bring your words. Bring your instructions, bring your statutes, bring, uh, bring the power of your word into my life and may it change me and make me more like you this year. And thank you, Jesus, for your power. Thank you that you are the living word and thank you that the written word points all of us to you. In his name, amen. So before we leave and do our benediction, I want to ask this question. As you look back over the COVID season, if you look back over the last year or so, what did you learn? What, what, what are you hoping to carry forward and not get back to normal? Because maybe normal wasn't that good. What did God teach you through that whole season? And if he taught you something that you would like to share with others, let me know because I'm going to have a couple of people share testimonies next Sunday of what they learned during the pandemic. What did you learn about your faith? What did you learn about family? What did you learn about life? What did you learn about priorities or pace? So come and find me or Kirk at KaneoChurch.com. You guys who are out online can reach out, and I'm going to have a couple of you share next week. Okay? So how about if we stand up a benediction, everybody? Uh, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everyone here and online said, Amen. We will see you at the beach at 1.30. God bless you, everybody.